So, um, quite a lot of you know that in April I went on a, a Bible study tour with Oak Hall, who are a Christian holiday company, um, to Israel. It was 11 days long. It's a lovely holiday. I really enjoyed the holiday itself, but of course it was pretty full on, lots and lots to do each day, um, because they wanted to get around as much um, of the area as they possibly could, of course. So, just to start off where um, we went on the trip that I went on. So, um, this left-hand side um, is a map. Obviously, the top half of Israel, there's a bit more of Israel down here, but we didn't go down there. So, um, you can see at the top it says Lake Tiberias, which is Galilee, or the Sea of Galilee. And we went, um, we spent three days up there in a hotel, came down through Nazareth, then went down all the way down via Jericho to Bethlehem, and then back up to Jerusalem. Um, coming through the West Bank as we came. So it was quite a, quite a lot of travelling as well, um, but seeing the country as we went through that was, of course, extremely interesting as well. Now, many people um, warned me to be prepared for some sort of emotional response whilst I was on this holiday. Um, and I have to say that in the event, I didn't really have that whilst I was on that holiday. I had great enjoyment, lots of learning, but I feel that I probably gained more as I've reflected and responded more emotionally as I've reflected on the trip than I did when I was actually there. My sister told me she spent her entire time sort of in tears while she was in Israel. Um, but it, it's, it's different for different people and it's different for us. Each of our walks with Jesus is different too. So the slide just um, with me leaning on a metal framed horse is at a place called Megiddo. Um, and Megiddo was, um, Lake Galilee is nearby, um, but Fort Megiddo was, um, during the biblical period, Megiddo was one of the most important cities in the country. And its location, which was up on a big mound of, of uh, well, a big mound, um, looked out over the um, international route that came through um, where there was pasture and growing and all the international um, sort of uh, transit went through this area. And of course it kept them in a very secure position and a place where they could sort of monitor what was going on and protect themselves as well. And it's actually um, mentioned in the Bible, in Judges, um, and it's an echo to the battles that can be found in the biblical Song of Deborah. The kings came, they fought, they fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh, I think, by the waters of Megiddo. So that's referenced into the Bible. And it's just fascinating bits of the Bible that Dan, our leader, read us at these different ancient places that we visited, um, sort of seeing the sort of biblical context of those, um, of those passages and having a visual image, which I'd never really had before, I suppose. So, um, having been in a hotel that was right on the shore of the Lake Galilee, um, as we came down in our bus to that hotel, um, Dan asked us whether we thought that the lake that we could see in front of us, Galilee, was bigger or smaller than we had imagined. Um, and half the bus thought it was bigger and half the bus thought it was smaller. And I thought, I'm not sure I've ever considered the size of Lake Galilee. <laughs> um, but however, it was just an interesting conversation that we all had. Um, but um, it does have lots of names. And in the Bible, it's called all of these names. And as you could see on the map at the beginning, it was called Lake Tiberias. So um, if you come across that lake called something else in the Bible, um, these are all the different names that you see. As we were singing Safe to Shore, actually, it reminded me of Lake Galilee. Um, and Lake Galilee, most of the time, well, all the time we were there, it looked pretty much like this. This is sunrise. I got up early two mornings, stood on the shore with Lake Galilee water lapping almost at my tips and my toes. Um, and if you want to see a million photos of the sun rising over Lake Galilee, I've got them. <laughs> because every moment it changed. And I'm a bit clicker happy with my camera. But it's a really peaceful place, except that it has this local sort of weather climbs. Because it's got lots of mountains and high ground around it, you can go from very, very peaceful sea to very rough waters, as we read in the Bible. On day two, we went and stood by a little chapel right on the lake of Galilee, right on the shore, had a little bit of beach nearby, and um, our guide read... Uh, 
Jesus and the miraculous catch of fish. So after Jesus has died, risen from the dead, and he comes to visit his, one of his um, appearances to his disciples. And I'm going to read it to you because this was the passage that was read whilst we stood on the shore. And it was, you could shut your eyes, listen to this passage and think, I can almost feel Jesus there. I can almost feel the disciples there. Um, and it probably wasn't the exact beach. But it was, Lake Galilee hasn't changed that much. It, it was really evocative to be there and listen to the scriptures read in that place. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, only about 100 metres. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. We had that passage not so long ago in our service. And the theme of our biblical tour, other than obviously going to places, in the evenings we were um, listening to a series by Andy, who was our speaker for the week, um, about meeting with Jesus. And this was day one. And here we were on the lake shore of Lake Galilee, meeting with Jesus. Everything was very bound in beautifully um, as a tour. Um, and yes, and that thing about putting, you know, they did what Jesus told them. Jesus said, do this, and they did it. They didn't question it, they just did it because they had faith in him. They, they sort of almost knew it was him, His, the atmosphere around him. They knew, and then they came to realize once they saw that miracle happen. So they obeyed what Jesus said. We also went out in a boat, and only a, three weeks before we arrived, the jetty that we would have caught the boat from was completely destroyed in a freak storm. Just as so to input into the story of our trip was that there had been a storm just before we'd arrived, thankfully not whilst we were there. And these boats, apparently, are supposedly, they say that we go in, are about the same size as the fishing boats they used to use on Lake Galilee. I'm not sure I quite believed that, to be fair, because there were 50 in our group. We got on this boat, and there was plenty of room for more. Um, so I'm not quite convinced that's the truth. But anyway, the style was the same. Maybe they've made them bigger to take more people. But it was really lovely just to go out onto the middle of Lake Galilee, have some um, Bible passages read to us, sing some songs, and he was a brilliant guitar player as well. So we really had a lovely time out there on Lake Galilee. And from there, we moved on to Capernaum. And when we um, got to Capernaum, we went in the entrance gates there, and there is some sculpture on the side in a beautiful garden. And this is one of the sculptures. Um, and it's a bench with a stone, what looks like just um, <coughs> a blanket laid on there, but it's actually the feet out the end give away that there is a person. It's not a real person, it's a sculpture. But of course, it relates to truly the passage from Matthew 25, 45. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And that was one of my real impact moments. I'm quite a visual person. And so seeing that in relation to that text really hit home somehow. 
um, that here we were going to a place where Jesus had um, done miraculous things, um, and the temple is some of the, the oldest remaining, supposedly remaining sort of um, actual stones that were there in Jesus' time in Capernaum, to actually be there and just hit home about how we need to serve one another, and in that we are serving our Lord. We um, had a bit of a teaching session, and then we were left to go and wander around Capernaum on our own. And on the um, right side of the slide here um, is the sort of temple where um, the centurion might have come, was nearby when Jesus approached him, and he asked about his servant being, um, being healed and saying, that, no, 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 you're, you're too good a man to come into my home I'll believe that, you, that my servant will be healed. And he was, and that centurion showed such a lot of faith in Jesus that he, he believed that Jesus could heal his servant. Um, and I, so I wandered around there a little bit, and then I wandered back down onto the shoreline. And this flower here belong, was part of a huge tree with these flowers all over, and it was the sweetest scent absolutely beautiful scent, um, honey, lemony scent. And I stood there with my eyes shut and this scent and, yeah, just really sort of focused on that thought of serving other people in relation to that man on the bench. So it was one of my um, impact moments in, in Capernaum there. This was another place we went to, to the Golan Heights, and I don't know if you just think about what you've heard about the Golan Heights, but all I've ever had in my head about the Golan Heights is that it's a dangerous place to be, um, and there's lots of fighting, and it's better you don't go there. It's very near to the West Bank, where there can be some disturbances, where some of the camps are now, where people are being you know, kept in. Um, it's the sort of Palestine versus Israel control, um, and it is still very visible um, it, as you go down through the West Bank. Um, but we arrived down um, onto the Golan Heights, and this is Lake Galilee spread out ahead of us. Um, and all that it was was a 40 minutes of sitting, scripture being read again, and then sitting looking over this peaceful lake. And I felt nothing but serenity and peace and calm in a place that had, in my head, been dangerous, horrid, and associated with negativity. Um, and I'm not going to draw any conclusions from that way. It was just the feeling at the time. There were beautiful wild flowers down. Um, and it was just that, you know, everything does change. God has got a plan. Things do move um, forward. And we just need to trust in him. We did, um, on our way down to Bethlehem, um, go to Nazareth. Now, when I had this vision that Nazareth was exactly like Nazareth village, which they have created in the middle of Nazareth. But Nazareth is a, you know, I don't know why I thought it wasn't a mid modern city. Um, you know, it's got tower blocks, it's bustling, it's hustling, uh, lots going on. But in the centre of Nazareth, there was an area of land that was preserved. Um, and I can't quite remember who owned it or what man would be able to tell me. But anyway, they've, they preserved it and then they've created a replica, if you like, of a Nazareth a village, how Nazareth would have been. Um, and you go around, and there's the, the sheep and the goats, and these people that are dressed up in biblical, um, the time of Jesus type outfits, and the man tending the field, and they're actually growing things there. Um, and there's ladies weaving, and they, they dye the um, wool and everything, and they told us what they used to dye the wool. Um, and it was a really, um, yeah, just really good experience. There were really ancient olive trees still there. And it helped me to really realize that in Jesus' younger days, this is where this sort of environment he was brought up with, a close-knit community where people cared and looked after one another. They all knew what each other they all did. Um, they all looked um, out for each other. And they created a space where Jesus grew up as a child. And so that was a really lovely experience. I'm going to skip Bethlehem <laughs> because I have to say, I'm not sure I really needed to go there. Um, Manger Square is um, just lots of cars hooting their horns, as far as I could see. It was absolute chaos. Um, and you queue up to go to where supposedly the manger was. And of course, it's important as a place where Jesus was born. However, the actual church that's been built over this place where supposedly the manger was, you queue up for lots of time. There's a lot of sort of 
gold inlay and beautiful buildings, lovely to photog for photography, but um, a little bit, yeah, touristy and um, didn't really impact me a great deal at all. Glad I've been. What did impact me, though, was when we stayed in uh, uh, Manger Street and in... Um, Nativity Hotel, or yeah, I can't quite remember. Anyway, it was just everything's themed around um, what you'd expect in Bethlehem. Um, what we did see out of our hotel room one night, my, my hotel, my, you know, my bedroom mate and me, was that there was this really, really bright star, um, and uh, it was just uh, it was just reminded us of that story. It was just seemed a really, really bright star that was out of the sky. We were on the fifth floor, so we had a nice view over all the other big buildings. So that was uh, Nazareth and then down through Bethlehem. Oh, this just, sorry, I forgot about this slide. This was the temple in Nazareth village um, and sort of the priest just sitting there, um, obviously a, a sort of actor or worker there. But it did, um, it was quite a lot smaller than I'd had envisaged really, these temples in these small villages, quite small um, synagogues, um, temples, whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah, but and that just put it in context again about this is where Jesus would have learned and talked and um, spoken um, as he learnt about um, his father and uh, grew up in his village. Um, we'd actually arrived in Jerusalem, but then we went out from Jerusalem to um, Masada and Engedi. Um, now, this is down by the Dead Sea. Um, and this is sort of going back into the Old Testament times around, um, you know, David and Saul and all of those um, people. So this is where this, that part of the Bible would have happened. Um, and so on the right-hand side of the slide are all uh, visuals of uh, the Dead Sea um, and the sort of deserty like um, uh, uh, scenery. And then Masada itself is up on a very, very high um, cliff um, sort of range. And it was the last bastion of the Jewish freedom. I'm reading from the um, little thing we got from them, but just to put it in context. Uh, the last bastion of Jewish freedom fighters against the Romans. Its fall signal signaled the violent destruction of the kingdom of Judah um, at the end of the Second Temple period. It was built by Herod, the king of Judah, and Masada was a palatial fortress in the style of the ancient Roman East. And it was due to Herod being a bit paranoid about, you know, people attacking him and taking over all his, um, his territories and things, which is why he built such a fortress up on a big cliff so he could protect him and his people. And it was just a beautiful... Um, I could have been, spent hours there just seeing the scenery around, um, seeing the, the ancientness of it. Some of it they've sort of rebuilt a bit so you can imagine how people lived there. And it was really just very interesting. Um, and then we went on to Engedi, which is an oasis, sort of. It's where there is a river running down in between all this desert land. And it obviously runs off into the Dead Sea, this water. Um, and it really brought the Old Testament alive. And it was the um, particular passage that we heard there was David, um, David sparing Saul's life when Saul was hunting David down. And although we are running a bit tight to time, I am going to read you this because um, it is a really good story and it's about someone hearing what God's telling them and doing it. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is, is in the desert of Engedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheepfolds along the way a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave, and the men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was con conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's, Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the, the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went on his way. And then David went out of the cave and called to Saul, My Lord and my King. 
When Saul looked behind him, David bowed and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And he said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord gave you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because it, he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See, there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done for me, but my hand will not touch you. David did what he knew was right, what he had been told by God, um, and he respected Saul's position as his lord. And so that really brought that alive. We saw lots of little caves, and Dan said, you know, that might be the sort of cave where Saul went into and David was hiding at the back. And I've never really had much of a visual of the Old Testament environment, and that gave that to me. So I hope I've given you a little hint of it on those slides today. And finally, we did, or we did, I did float in the Dead Sea. It was a good experience, but I'm not sure. I thought that was going to be a wonderful, um, wonderful, exciting experience. And it was a little bit, um, yeah, touristy and drab, to be honest. But glad I did it, but I wouldn't rush back to do it again. <laughs> and of course, eventually, we came to the Mount of Olives. That's where our coach went up to, to begin with. And from the Mount of Olives, you look across to Jerusalem. And of course, this is a classic view of Jerusalem, but of course, the thing that's major there is the mosque, the shining gold mosque roof. Um, and a quarter, the quarter of um, Jerusalem that is Muslim run is the biggest part of the four quarters of Jerusalem. Um, so that's a very classic uh, visual of that. And then some of the other um, quarters of Jerusalem, if you, I didn't know before I went to Jerusalem, actually, that I'm, well, I must have been told in the past, but I couldn't remember that there were four quarters. But there's a Christian quarter, which I have to say is rather commercial. <laughs> um, it's where all the stalls, and you can do a lot of shopping. Bought a very nice pair of camel sandals there. Um, and then there's the Jewish quarter. Um, the Jewish quarter, probably the thing you'd most associate with that is the Wailing Wall. Um, and it was a fascinating square. That's just, um, the Whirling Wall's just at the back there. And I don't know what I was expecting. There were lots of traditional Jewish um, dress men, who were obviously Jews, in that Jewish quarter. And they all have the hats, the bit of hair that they don't chop off down the side of them, their um, faces. I don't know all the technical things. The phylactery boxes, their prayer boxes on their heads. There were bar mitzvahs going on on the male side of the Wailing Wall. There were, um, they wear the little sort of string things, which I can't remember what they signify around their waist. They were everywhere. You, could, you couldn't not know you were in the Jewish quarter. But what I found fascinating was at the, the wall, um, it was so peaceful. There were thousands of people there, but there was no hubbub. There was no real noise. It was so peaceful and so serene. There was real spirituality in that Jewish quarter. Um, the Holy Sepulchre, however, <laughs> in the Christian quarter, I wish never to go there again. Um, it is beautiful visually, some of it. It is a very high, big church, but there's so many people queuing up to see where maybe Jesus was buried and maybe where Jesus was crucified. I'm pretty sure they weren't as close as they are in the Holy Sepulchre. Um, and going out to the garden tomb outside the walls in Jerusalem, I think probably is more reflective of where actually Jesus was laying. But that is insignificant, really. But it was so commercial, it was so busy, it was so hubbubby, um, and so um, lots of gold inlay and things, um, and it didn't really do much for me, I have to say, a, a disappointing visit to the Holy Sepulchre. Um, the Armenian quarter, which is the uh, fourth quarter, is very tiny, very quiet, um, the priests there are a little bit more reminded me of um, the sort of Greek Orthodox with big sort of tall hats, um, but only saw one or two of those. But it was very quiet and very peaceful. Um, and in the Armenian quarter, there is a place um, that says it might have been the place of the upper room where um, Jesus and his disciples had the Last Supper um, and things. So I, I wandered around um, Jerusalem. Very quickly, you get your bearings. We we arrived and walked up through Jerusalem to our hotel on the last day of Ramadan. And frankly, my first walk through Jerusalem, I was terrified. 
it was, there were people all crowded in. I hadn't really connected with it being the last day of Ramadan um, until later on. Um, we were trying to follow Dan, and there were 50 of us, so you can imagine what chaos that was, um, getting through there. And we arrived at the other side. But during the next three days, going through Jerusalem into different places, very soon got our bearings. And on our off day, I just wandered around, knew where I was most of the time. Um, it's quite small and quite um, succinct. And I went back out and walked all the way up the Mount of Olives again and looked back up on my own to Jerusalem and had some quiet time just thinking of Jesus on the Mount of Olives um, with his disciples um, and trying to cut out all the, the high-rise buildings behind Jerusalem um, and... Yeah, and just thinking what it might have been like then. So there's quite a lot of contemplation and reflection. It was the only, the only off day we had, so it's the only time to really gather your thoughts completely on your own. Um, yeah, our first night in Jerusalem, no sleep, last day of Ramadan. I don't know why celebrations. These countries are, involve revving engines and <laughs> beeping horns, but they certainly celebrate the end of Ramadan. And the smells of the food coming up from the street into our hotel were, were glorious, but it was very, very noisy. As I mentioned, our whole theme during the week was meeting with Jesus. Um, it was very well done by Andy, and Dan was um, a young man um, who actually came from the Oak Hall Church and is an elder there. He was a brilliant leader. He constantly read scripture to us, constantly fed us information about where we were. Absolutely brilliant guide. Um, but I think the thing that I, some of those thoughts will have come through, obviously, but what I was most surprised at is all, in amongst all the busyness of that tour and getting on and off coaches and in and out, um, being in Israel does make you, you know, we were on a biblical tour, our minds were in that mindset, but thinking of Jesus, me meeting with Jesus, this isn't a detached story, this is about me and my relationship with Jesus. And so through all the series of talks, all through the singing, talking to other Christians who were in our group, um, just reminded me that God oversees and looks after us. So just another few images. This was in the Muslim quarter on, on the left. And, and from a photographic point of view, I love this photograph, but actually it demonstrated to me the atmosphere, or it demonstrates and sort of don't demonstrates. It shows the feeling within the Muslim quarter that I found quite dark and quite depressing, and I'm sure that is because I'm a Christian in the Muslim quarter, um, and it felt a little bit um, oppressive. Um, whereas uh, this is the uh, well, what's called the Garden of Gethsemane, um, and that felt free and beautiful and really rich and lovely. Um, and that's Dan just reading some scripture to us in the um, where the pools of Bethesda. I always get this wrong. Thank you, Bethesda. Um, and that was just a really lovely time. There's a lovely church there where we sang and the um, echoes really create a great, um, a great um, expansion of your voices. It sounds like you've got a really big choir singing. It was lovely singing in there. And all of the trip just reminded me that um, when you offer your life to Jesus and you're a part of him, whatever goes on in your life, the thing is that it's, he has died for you and he wants to present you faultless. And uh, this uh, flower was actually in that garden where, by the Paul's Bethsaida as well. But oh, <laughs> you know which one I mean, where the where man who was lame was healed by Jesus. Um, it's a beautiful flower and it was just open and free and beautiful. And the um, Jude blessing is um, sort of bizarrely sort of sums up my trip. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Saviour be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. It's not about me. It's about him. It's not what I want. It's about his plan for my life because that will not only give me the best of life, but it will also be in line with his plan. Um, I hope my, my reflections are helpful to you as well and hasn't just been a slideshow of my trip. If anybody wants to see a lot more slides, I have many more if you want me to show you. Um, I can certainly share those with anyone who would like to. 